You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Hey, Founder Church, welcome to worship today. As we dive into the Word of God, Jesus starts talking to us about light and dark in Luke chapter 11. And um, we understand this balance, right? This time of year, Um, We are starved for sunshine up here in the Mitten State, in the great northern part of uh, the United States. In the middle of winter, like right around December 21, when winter hits its, when the solstice hits and it's dark from like, you know, I don't know, like 4 p.m. until 9 the next morning, it feels like it's dark 20 hours a day. You go to work and it's dark and you're like, oh, and you get out of work and you're like, it's still dark. And if you work indoors, like you don't see the sun. And It's really hard. It's really hard. And when the sun comes out, like you're just like, oh, and you see all these Michiganders just standing in their yard because that great ball of fire has returned to the sky and it's not this overcast look. It just feels so good when the light shines. It feels so good in the summer when the days are extraordinarily long, right? 6 a.m. sunrise and like 10 p.m. it finally gets dark. I love me some of those days. The light and the dark. Jesus talks about it today. And one of the things I want to do is maybe look at it from a few different vantage points. I I know this, like my mother-in-law was raised uh, right here in Michigan. And she told a story to my wife when she was a child of playing hide-and-seek. And, and I know, like, maybe it's not as popular now, which, boo, if it's not, because it was awesome. I loved playing hide-and-seek. I still kind of dig it. We'll play it at the house sometimes, but there's only so many places you can hide this big a sack of potatoes in the house. Like, I always get found, but it's because I'm ginormous. Um, but as, as we, like, talk about this, like, my mom-in-law would tell the story of how she would be out playing with her friends, hide-and-seek, at, at night on, in the neighborhood, And all the kids would be running around, you know, kind of this Americana vision in your head. And they're all running around playing. And the, you know, the kid who was, um, who was it would, not it, the horrifying clown, but it, they like to go find him. I'm very clear. That's not hide and seek. That's terrible. Um, But she, you know, they would cry out like out west. They would say like, apple, peaches, pumpkin pie. If you're not ready, holler I. And No. That didn't happen up here, did it? You're like, what kind of weird, it was California, give them a break. That's what they said. They like apple, peaches, and pumpkin pie. And if you weren't ready, you holler or die. And here, it was probably ready or not, here I come. Yeah, I love that. So, it's just, yeah. Okay, anyways. So, she hears the words, ready or not, here I come. But she's in the middle of like trying to find a place to hide and can't find a place. So, she just kind of flops into the ivy. <laughs> she just lays in the ivy, in a patch of ivy. I don't even know it, but I can picture it in my head like, oh, you know, and flops down. And she's laying in the ivy, and the kids all, you know, the game goes on, and eventually nobody finds her. And I, I guess she wins or something. And one of the boys is like, the boy who was it said to her, well, I saw you. I saw you laying in the ivy. I just thought you were the old lady from next door. <laughs> Like, how horrible is that? You're like, D- dude, dude, if you ever want a glimpse into the, the heart and mind of a little boy, that's it. Like, boy, that lady is in the ivy. After I'm done with hide and seek, I'll worry about that. And then if you offer them a juice box, they totally forget, right? I love that line. Well, I saw you there. I just thought, you were the old lady from next door. When, when we look at this idea of light and darkness, in the van, from the vantage point of Jesus Christ, we get God's view of what's going on. And I want to take a minute, read the text, and then we're going to unpack the text one by one. It's one of these verses where I, or one of these chunks of scripture where it's good to just spend time in it. Um, follow along with me as I read. Jesus says, Luke eleven thirty three to 36, no one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand so that those who come in may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body is also full of light, but when they are unhealthy, your body also is full of darkness. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be just as full of light as when a lamp shines on you. This is one of those texts where you're like, what? 
You don't fully maybe understand it, but one of the things that I love about our God is that he, he, he glories in distinction. He's a God who, who puts clear lines of, uh, there's a line of demarcation. There is light and there is darkness. And it's been since the very beginning. And in this, Jesus is saying, the light is good and the darkness is bad. There are things that go on in the darkness that are bad. And Jesus talks about this. And he leans into this. And we need to understand that God doesn't have a big gray area of like, well, it's kind of light, kind of dark. No, God has very clear lines. He's a God of distinction, light and darkness. So when we look at this today, we need to understand Jesus is calling us to the light. He is calling us to the light. Here's what it says, verse 33. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or puts it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand so that those who come in may see the light. So the question I would, or the challenge I would like to extend is, don't hide the light. Don't hide the light of Christ that is within you. Don't conceal the light. There's a reality to this that we, we have to wrestle with. It gets very personal right away in this teaching because we conceal the light quite often in our own lives. Maybe we can, here's some of the ways I see it. Maybe the, the subtle lies that we tell, that we're like, no, it won't hurt anybody, but, but I'm gonna tell this subtle lie. Maybe it's the justifications we make in our life to, to be a certain way, or even more, the way we justify not shining the light, the way we justify not sharing our faith with the world around us, the way we justify our ill temper at the world around us when we are called to be people who give witness to Christ. And so we are seen as this blustery, mean individual instead of someone who has been softened by the grace of God and kind and tender. We justify being us when God called us to become like Christ, to shine the light. Maybe we, um, maybe we live in a life of secret pleasures. There's these hidden little things that we keep to ourselves that we think no one else knows about. But in the world we live in, there is a spiritual component. And the spiritual component knows the secrets. It knows the secrets All these things in darkness are not hidden to what goes on in the spiritual world. So when we have these secret pleasures, they actually leak into our regular everyday ordinary lives. They affect the relationships we're in. They create distrust, a lack of unity. They create a sense of betrayal. They do all these things because we have these little secrets that we think are just ours. Maybe we have little hidden addictions that we think I can keep under control. I can hold on to this and I can control this thing and it's the proverbial holding the tiger by the tail. Eventually it turns around and and mauls you, right? We have these little hidden things that we do and it hides the light. And I wanna challenge you, don't hide the light. Don't hide the light and have these justifications that keep you from shining the light of Christ because when you conceal the light, you starve it. You starve the light. In the ancient biblical world, there would have been this little, um, it almost, it's kind of funny, it looks like a little clay Aladdin's lamp. There would have been a pool of olive oil in there and they would there's a little hole at the top and they would light that hole and the flame would burn there and the oil would just keep feeding as it burned away. It was this cool little invention. And if you took a bowl and put it over the light, it's the same as when you take like a candle and you put a snuffer over the top of it. You don't pinch the flame out, you starve it for oxygen. You kill the light by hiding it. And we have to understand when we hide the light, when we have these secret little hidden things, we kill the light of Christ that shines, that is supposed to shine out of our lives. We literally... We literally starve it for sunlight, right? We start, not for sunlight, for oxygen. We starve it from, from being what it was made to be. So when we look at this, we understand that the light matters. And we know this, that the light shines and does a couple of things. A, it lights the way. 
right? It lights the way. But it also exposes what's in the dark. It exposes what's in the dark. And sometimes I think we'd rather just not know what's in the dark. But the reality is that when things get exposed in the light, you know, if, if you're walking through your house in the middle of the day and let's say you have something set out in the hallway and you're just walking by like the vacuum's there. You know, it's, it's sitting there. Someone left it there. And, and you're like, you walk by in the middle of the day, no big deal. But you walk by that thing at 3 a.m. when it's pitch black and you kick it like a field goal kicker. Why? Because there's no light to expose it. The light comes and exposes it. One of the things that happened to our family that uh, this is my image of the light exposing something. Oh, it was one of the worst. Oh, Bucky. Um, we were in Manhattan. We were in lower Manhattan. We went on a vacation as a family. And we were, we were just, oh, we hiked our kids. I think we had 28,000 steps by the end of this day. It was brutal. It was like a day at Disney without the rides or Mickey Mouse. Like it was a lot of walking and we were all over that city and we were down in lower Manhattan down in the financial district and over by the courthouses and stuff coming out of Little Italy and Chinatown and we were headed towards um, uh, One World Trade Center where we were going to catch a subway and head back uptown and we're walking. It's pretty dark um, in spots and there were huge piles of garbage outside of these buildings and at night the garbage collectors come and get them and um, it was about 11 at night and they're, you know, they had not started coming through, and I'll never forget, like these huge piles of garbage, didn't think anything of it, it was pretty dark still, but out in the distance, there was a light and a pile of garbage right under it, and the garbage was pulsating, and I was like, what is that? Like, you know, it just, garbage shouldn't move, you know? And as we got closer, I'm like, what's going on? Once we got from, I, I would say about 20 feet away, there were dog-sized rats, hundreds of them. And I was like, oh, my word. And when they saw us, they just went like, just think of the sound of a movie. And they all went underground. I'm like, I can't see them anymore. Like, it, the light exposed what was going on in all the garbage piles. We hadn't noticed because it was too dark. And when I saw what was going on, trust me, I walked over every storm sewer grate, kind of like, oh. I didn't want one of those things running up my pant leg. Like, that was horrifying. Like, it exposed what was in the dark. How cruel is it if I see someone who is struggling in the dark and I have the light and I do nothing to aid them? Think again of that little boy in my mom in law's story. Like, it, is, it seems so mean that he's like, oh, I totally saw it. I just thought it was the old lady next door. Like, if I said that, if we were playing hide and seek as a church staff, which maybe that needs to happen. That sounds kind of fun. Um, but like we're playing hide and seek, and I come by the outside of church, and somebody's laying face down, and I'm like, oh, that looks like that lady from, that works at the farmhouse. I'll catch her afterwards. You'd be like, have you no heart, right? It's, it's something for a little boy that you're like, okay, kind of cute, but terrible in its own way. But, but what about us? We see people walking in the darkness continually, how cruel is it that we have the light of Christ in our life and we do nothing to shine it because of our hidden dalliances, our pleasures, our different things that we are justifications, the subtle lies, the little things that allow us a justified existence of concealing the light. It's cruel, it's unbiblical, and Christ isn't okay with it. The next scripture says this, your eye is the lamp of the body. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body is also full of light. But when they are unhealthy, your body is full of, dar uh, full of darkness. So let's, let's think of it this, this way, like what is a healthy eye? What is a healthy eye? What is, what is healthy? What you take into your soul affects, well, your very being. The entirety of you, what you take in affects what's going on out of you, what's coming out of you, because, well, garbage in, garbage out. So what we take in matters. Are you taking in evil images, right? Are you taking in, maybe you're somebody who loved a certain kind of rock back in the day, right? And you're like, yeah, I was a huge, like, really, I was into some of the darker metal bands, and it's still, I just love it. You know, maybe that's you. But I would say to you and I would challenge you, fair enough, I get it. But, um, but if you're still 
diving into that stuff as a believer, there's a darkness that, that shouldn't be tolerated. There's a darkness that shouldn't be there. What you take in affects what comes out. Are you allowing your mind and heart to be filled by darkness, by what you look at, what you take into your life? We have to understand the impact of having a healthy eye. But what if, what if we take a minute and we just play with the wording of this? What if we play with the wording of this and say, when your whole body is full of light, your eyes are bright. When your whole body is full of light and light, your eyes are bright and it brightens your eyes. An unhealthy eye has a certain attitude and so does a healthy eye. So a healthy eye is in the Jewish understanding would be generous. It would be an eye always seeking an opportunity to serve, to care, and to engage in a missional way the world around it. An unhealthy eye would constantly be looking for what you can get, looking for an opportunity to be served and never to serve someone else. So when we look at it, we understand we must answer the question, how do we look at people? Are we opportunistic for what we can get or are we opportunistic for what God can do in shining the light out of us? When we ask those kind of questions, it gets really uncomfortable because we know this that things grow in the dark. I mean, the mushroom industry would say amen to that, right? You know, it's, it's really, I mean, the, yeah, we won't go there, but the, the, if you, you just study the growing of mushrooms, and you'll be like, oh, we eat that, right? Not because they're bad, but because it grows in the dark. Things grow in the dark. So what kind of things that grow within our soul darken our vision? What kind of things darken our vision? change the way we see the world. Greed, pride, jealousy, self-focus, prejudice, bias, lust. Like these things take constantly and they define and div define, divide and break people apart by value based on our scale, not God's. And when we look at this, we understand there is really two... Here's a game we used to play as a family. We'd be sitting at the dinner table, and we'd say this, cowboy face. And uh, the kids would be like, you know, and we'd be like, happy face, sad face. So I'm going to have you guys help me out here, okay? I'm going to say a certain kind of face, and I want you to, to help me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blind myself by the lights, so sorry for the camera, but, but help me out here. Um, just do this for me. Show me a generous face. Awesome. Okay, it was it's funny because people are just like, wait a minute. And then I made him do it. All right, so so that was a generous face. It was really good. And, I, and I'll impersonate it in a minute for you because I'm going to have you do it as well. Um, do me a favor now. Show me a jealous face. Okay, here's what just happened. This is awesome. And this is the danger of doing like uh, this kind of human experiment in, in live time because it might not have worked, but it super did. Okay. <laughs> Here's, here, I'm going to reflect back to you what you just did to me. When I said show me a generous face, everybody went like this. Right? When I said show me a jealous face, everyone went like this. Do you notice the posture of my eyes? Do you get that? A generous face opens wide and says, come near to me. Chuck Swindoll, in his book, The Grace Awakening, would say it was a yes face. My poor bride has a yes face. Every telemarketer, um, person handing out a pamphlet trying to make her a Buddhist or a Mormon or sell her some kind of product in the mall, they look at her, they look at me, and not one of them comes to me because I'm like, you tell me my eyeballs need or my eyebrows need to be threaded and I'm going to thump you in your Adam's apple. Thwack. Like, get away from me, you know? But she looks at him and she has a yes face. She's like, and I'm like, don't smile at him. Oh my gosh, why did you do that? No, we don't want... You, you know, to put your hand cream on us, right? But her yes face betrays that she's approachable. It is a generous eye, right? Isn't that, isn't that kind of cool? We were talking about this when we were, when we were looking at the sermon, and, and I was like, yeah, that's super true. It's super true. Our face literally proves this scripture true. A generous face is like, it's, it's a yes face, a, a jealous face, a face that wants what you have 
is a little bit more darkened and concealed and pulled in and tight. I think it holds theologically and practically to say our face often betrays the light and the darkness that's within us. Verse 35. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Don't be tricked by, well, spiritually fluorescent light, right? Don't be tricked by this. Right here it speaks to the way that the enemy, Satan, likes to attack the Christian. He gets us distracted by lightish things. Not light, but lightish. Lightish things. These are good teachings. Remember, good. They're not bad, but they're, they're just good. They're teachings that make me feel good about myself. They give me some world-based, some, some culture-based wisdom, and these things sound, well, biblical-ish, right? But I want to tell you, in Scripture, eat, pray, love is never said in the same little sentence. But I know a lot of Christians who hold up eat, pray, love, this, this mantra of like, yeah, yeah, you know, eat, pray, love, like it just sounds so good and noble. It's Literally, those words are in Scripture separately, but they're never mashed together. That is a self-centered wisdom that is indulgent and will break your life by causing you to be only inward focused. And when you're inward focused, you never set your eyes on the light of God. And it's hard for the light of Christ to reflect of something that will not face it. So we have to look at it and understand that these biblical-ish things, these light-ish things, are nothing more than a device of the enemy to get our, our, literally, our reflectors off the one whom we seek to reflect. Usually you don't even notice that you are slowly focusing on one person when when you're dealing with these worldly wisdom things. You don't notice that slowly but surely the focus is going from, you know, here at the foundry, we're like, be in the word of God. Invite the Holy Spirit to fill you. Be in the community of God. Have your eyes outward. But when you lean into these these world kind of based mantras, these Bible-ish sounding sayings, these wisdoms, what does it do? It slowly takes a broad view and pulls it back in and you find yourself focusing on you. But it's all good and noble, right? Because in the end, you are you're being helped. You're maybe learning something. You're empowered. But it's got no focus on God who is the true light. And when we get distracted from him, from prayer, from his word, and the filling and obedience we do to the Holy Spirit, we are filled with the Spirit and obeying him, we begin to have a counterfeit light within us. And it has a hollow ring that doesn't bring life to the face. Have you ever seen yourself in fluorescent light and you're like, Tell me, anyone tell me that's not what I look like. Because it's a counterfeit light. It's it's a light that doesn't set right on us. Buying into your best self is a lie from the pit of hell. There is not a best you. There's a you who becomes like the best, Jesus Christ. There's a you that becomes like Christ. We, according to scripture, are called to die to ourself so that we can fully live in Christ. Don't let light-ish things deceive you that you're the center of the universe. Because we love to think that we are. We're just not. He is. He's the true light. Lean into him. Verse 36. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be just as full of light as when a lamp shines on it. Here's what I love, and I think this is a great application uh, kind of point for us, a way to hold it in real time. If you're outside, let's say you're at Ottawa State Beach, right, which is our big beach on Lake Michigan, and if you're like watching on the West Coast, like we have good beaches, actually, we don't have sharks or salt. It's awesome, and they're huge sandy beaches. It's great, but we have these rangers, right, and they'll come up. Let's just imagine you're, you're laying there in the sun, enjoying the sun, because you know in December it's going to be Iceberg Central. So you're laying there enjoying the sunshine, and a ranger walks up. And he's like, takes his little mag light, and he's like, what are you doing here? And shines it on you. And it's like 85 degrees and bright and clear and sunny. And he shines his light on you. He's like, what are you doing? You'd be like, you're a doorknob. Why are you doing that? Because his flashlight wouldn't make any difference. You're fully lit up. You're in the light. It wouldn't make a lick of difference, right? Because you're in the light. So why do you need to shine your light on me? You know, why do you got to do that to me? That's really weird. And he's like, I don't want to see anything coming, you know, being weird today. And walks off and you're like, boo, like what's wrong with you, you know? But let's say that same ranger comes up to your tent 
and you're, you're camped out at the beach. And he, he opens your tent, which would be weird, but that's whole, just stay with the story. And he lo- in the middle of the night, he opens your tent and he shines that light in your eyes. You'd be like, whoa, what's going on? And it would blind you. It would blind you because in the darkness, that little beam of light would be everything you see. And it would be jostling and it would jolt you awake. And the reality is, when we live in the darkness, sometimes a small light from God will shock us and it will be jolting to our world. It will reveal and show something in us that we never wanted to see. And we have to recognize and understand that this little light in the darkness reveals what kind of darkness we're in. It reveals how dark it actually is. Because when God shines his spirit, his spirit on us and just like a beam and we're in darkness, it jolts us, it pulls us out of our comfort, comfort zone and we are confronted with the truth of God's word and it feels shocking or jarring into us to have that little ray of light on us. But when you're in the light on Ottawa Beach, 85 degrees, clear and sunny, makes no difference in the world because you are already in the light so that little, that same ray of beam of light from a mag light makes no difference for us because if we are in the light, the light of God isn't jarring. It's already fully revealed. Everything's clear and out in the open. Live in the light. God exposes things we have hidden in the darkness with light. And we have to welcome that into our lives. So let's apply this quickly, really in one way. I want to ask a question. I need you to lean in and ask, does the light of God shine through my life? Or are there areas I purposely keep dark? Do you have a room in your house where you're like, we just don't go in there. We may open the door and throw things in. It's the junk room. Or maybe you have a junk drawer and a company comes over and they go to look for silverware and you're like, not that drawer. And you talk really weird because you're like, if you looked in there, it's an emotional breakdown in a drawer. It's all the crazy of your life crammed in with the chargers you never use anymore, right? You have, we all have that drawer and we keep it in darkness. And, and there are things we intentionally keep dark. I want to ask it again. Does the light of God shine through your life? Ask yourself that question and then follow it up with this. Do you purposely keep things dark in your life so you don't reflect the light of God? We have to be people who reflect him well. We have to be people who understand that we are like those little mirrors. Like I remember in uh, high school, we made my uh, metals teacher, Mr. Welch. He was, he was grumpy, but he was a good guy. And we would take the light streaming through the windows and catch it off our watches. And we would have, um, <laughs> we'd have little battles on the walls. We'd be like, you know, you did, I don't, maybe you didn't do this. This is why I had a really low GPA, by the way. I'm not giving educational advice, but we'd be like, and one day he lost his mind. He's like, what are you doing? You could be electrocuted. I'm trying to help you and save you. And I'm like, I'm about to win. Oh, boo, Mr. Welch ruined our, you know, fairy battle because it looked like Tinkerbell up there. We were dorks. I get it. But we were reflecting something. We were, well, we were taking a small thing and reflecting something on a wall. We should be like that. The light of Christ We should be like we said a long time ago, we should be like the moon reflecting the light of the sun onto the earth. I love these silver winter nights where the full moon will shine down and it just illuminates everything. That is the life of the Christian. Be someone whose light shines into the darkness of this world and make no excuse when it doesn't. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for your church that shines the light of Christ. Convict us of sin. And bring us ever more into your light so that the darkness that tries to envelop us is broken away by the spirit that illuminates us. God, we love you. We give you praise for who you are and the way you are redeeming lives like ours and helping them become reflective of you, Lord Jesus Christ. May your gospel go forward through the lives we lead. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Thank you.